Hello and welcome to the Thread to Men podcast. My name is Taylor and I come to you from Baltimore, Maryland, and this is a podcast about all things fiber related. I generally speak on the subjects of knitting and spinning. And in this week's episode, I just have a few works in progress to show you. Um, before we dive into that, I'll just let you know I'm wearing uh, a project I've probably never shown you before. I kind of set out to write a pattern for this and then discovered it wasn't everything I wanted it to be. Um, and then I just kind of quit the idea of, of publishing this pattern. But I will tell you how I constructed it in case you're interested to you know, I might be able to, um, you know, help you facilitate making it if, if you feel like you want to. But um, this shirt is knit with, um, let me see. I want to say three skeins of O Wool's O Wash fingering in the kind of split pea, soupy green colorway. I forget the name of this, to be honest with you. Um, and then one skein of O Wool's uh, also O Wash fingering in Barn Owl. This like nice kind of cool sort of grayish white. And then two skeins of speckled yarn. So one is, uh, I want to say... Uh, well, one is Olan in the corn colorway, and then the lighter one is that really popular speckle thing from Ireland. What is that dyer's name? Oh, I lost the tag to it. It's one of those, oh, hedgehog, hedgehog, two-ply fingering weight, and it's, uh, I want to say, like, fool's gold. It's like the yellow with speckles. Um, but I, uh, I'll stand up so you can get a little peek of it. I um, cast on from the bottom with a cable cast on, and then I did just two rows of garter. So the bottom I think is really cool, and it's it's probably one of my favorite kind of hems that I've made because it's really sturdy, it has a little bit of stretch, it's not very rigid. Um, like for instance, like this is it there, and I can stretch it all the way out here. So I might even substitute this kind of cast on for other projects in the future. Um, but I knit, so I did the cable cast on, I want to say I knit and then I purled and then I started stocking it. So there's no ribbing to keep it um, from rolling. And, and I would say like, at least with this fiber, like it doesn't roll at all. I don't know that it wouldn't roll with, with other fibers, but I feel like um, this is a, a hem that I really like a lot. And this is just something I kind of made up. Um, as far as I know, someone's probably done it before. Knitting is like a really old skill, but um, I've just never seen anyone do that and I wanted to play around with it. And what I did was I held throughout um, three strands together at a time. So I started by holding on three strands of Barn Owl. And I think right as soon as I was done, um, kind of establishing the bottom hem and then knitting one row. I took out one strand of Barn Owl and I added my lightest in my fade. So I basically faded Barn Owl, one skein of speckles, another similar skein of peckle, speckles in a darker colorway that kind of blended towards another solid. So there's just four colors in this pattern and I would knit uh, I'm sure I wrote it down, but um, I would knit a few rows and then drop another solid from the first color and add a second of the second color. So I was kind of uh, marling the whole sweater while slowly adding one, taking one out, adding another of the same, taking one out, then knitting a whole row, at least I want to say, with all three of the same colors and then dropping one to take the third color in. Um, and I was really, the reason I'm not like taking the time to put this out there is mostly just cause, I don't know. I just, I use, so I'm a small person. I always knit small, um, size small garments, sometimes extra small if I feel like my gauge is a little bit bigger just to like maybe not make something too big. Um, 
and I was really like, I was really measuring my skeins. <laughs> I was measuring closely to make sure that I had enough for every row that I needed in the future and then enough to mirror it up top. Um, I would say though that if I were to make this again, I could simplify the pattern in terms of writing it out by, um, so one point I didn't make a moment ago that I was trying to get to is that I used every bit of the speckled skeins of yarn and mostly the barn owl too. So even though I had more than enough in the solid color, which I was working with like two or three skeins of, um, I just, I, I don't know that you would get the same product in various sizes. And of course, like this is an oversized thing. You might only really need to draft like, I would say three different types of sizes because it's not like it, it needs to fit. I mean, you could make, you can make a lot of different sizes if you wanted to be exact and like how many measure, how many inches of ease should a body have, right? But um, I'm typically like a third, I'm a 32 inch bust. I would guess that there's, I don't know, like eight inches of positive ease. And it was just made to be like a, like a pillowcase type thing. Uh, and it's literally a square. Like, there's no shaping. <laughs> it's literally like, it's knit, um, it's actually two squares. So that's another thing that made it more complicated in terms of like, uh, measuring out my yarn skeins is that I was knitting it one time and a second time and then a third time and a fourth time and then bringing them together. I think that it could have been knit in the round, um, but I wanted it to have some structure because it's such a structureless garment. Um, sorry, my bra straps keep poking out. That bugs me. Uh, so I wanted it to have structure and I think I also, I, what, uh, I didn't, um, I had never pieced anything before this and I like whip stitched it together. So it's like, has like a, a seamy seam. It doesn't have like a mattress stitch seam, which is almost invisible, which I, I don't know why I didn't do that. I think I was just like overwhelmed by the thought of not having instructions for this. Um, but I will say it's one of my, it's one of, it's, it's something I enjoy throwing on. Um, I, I guess if the idea of it is well received, maybe I'll try drafting a pattern. I don't, I don't know what's wrong. I don't know why. I don't know why. I guess I just want some reassurance that like, this is cute. I don't know. Before I like put it out there into the world as something anyone else should make. You know what I'm saying? So, um, I like it. I think it's, uh, it's really also the fabric, like holding, holding, uh, maybe I held four strands together. Let me see if I can pick it apart just to double check my facts here. But, um, yeah, I was holding four strands together for this project. Um, and I think that's overkill. I wanted the fade to be, to be really like faded and I didn't want any kind of like breaks in the color. Um, and so I wanted to have it, you know, gradiate longer than shorter. And so I held four strands together for this. And because of that, it's like a heavy fabric. It is not a loose, it's, it's not, um, it'd probably make a really nice winter staple type long sleeve thing if, if it were d constructed in that way somehow. But, uh, I think as a t-shirt, it might be nicer to have just three strands and find a different kind of gradient yarn that's you know, not such a huge step from one solid to another solid. If you did like all speckles or like all of one color, um, you could just hold three together and get a similar effect. So I pretty much just cast on the number of stitches I wanted for the width 
and then knit a square and then knit another square and then I brought them together with just a three needle bind off with an exposed seam and then I knit uh, before I want to say before casting off the back I knit a few short rows just to bring the back up a little bit so it would sit well on the on the shoulders um, and then I did just a row around to close up the neck and give it structure there. Um, the squares that I knit to come together I slipped the stitch on the edge of um, I slipped the first stitch on the edge of the square so that the armholes wouldn't roll in um, and they do roll in a little bit but I feel like that gives a little bit of added structure too where it almost appears like a finished kind of um, like it doesn't appear unfinished because it rolls in ever so slightly and of course it has no name because it's not really out it doesn't really it's not a real thing so um, so that's that and I've never shown it to you for whatever reason but um, it is like really open here so if you're not comfortable with you know a tank top or a bra kind of peeping out then it might not be the right type of thing uh, to make but I feel like that's the thing that makes it the most seasonally appropriate because it is such a heavy fabric um, I mentioned possibly making it a long sleeve too and I think if uh, it wouldn't it wouldn't at all be the same but making it um, maybe just a little bit more narrow at the waist, like that type of ease, and then making it a dolman sleeve with the same fade could be really cool too. So uh, I just had these speckled skeins in my stash and I was coveting them and I wanted to make them into something and everyone's fading everything all of the time and I was like, this is my fade. So I just thought I would I just thought I'd make my own fade thing. Uh, yeah, so that is, I guess, a finished object, even though it's months old in my world. I want to show you what I'm working on. Uh, I have a sweet little basket here from the thrift store. I love it. It has these cute little hooks. I feel like I could suspend it from the ceiling and make it a little like side table or something if I wanted to. Um, but with my cats, I feel like that is dangerous territory for a broken basket. I, I have this nervous tick I notice when I edit, that I make this sound with my mouth. So if you notice that, I'm sorry. It's something I can't even control almost. Uh, but I'll edit it out as much as I can. <laughs> Uh, this is my ranunculus sweater. I showed you what I had cast on, I think, a week ago. And I love this sweater. I can't wait to wear it. It's one of the most cropped garments I've ever made. Like, I thought that this shirt I'm wearing now would be quite cropped. And it is. Like, these pants are high-waisted. It comes right over the button, which I like because it gives you some um, little bit of insurance. Like, if I lift my arms up, there's just a tiny bit of midriff there. Um, but this is, like more cropped than that like significantly so this is not a shirt that I'm likely to wear with any pair of pants unless they're above my navel um, but I have a lot of dresses that have sort of empire-ish waist things happening and I feel or not even like I have a linen maxi dress that I wear a lot and I feel like this is gonna layer over dresses really well um, and I can put on like stockings or leg warmers to wear with them in the winter. So this is a nice layering piece for kind of continuing my summer wardrobe into the fall and winter. This is knit, um, as I mentioned previously in another episode with Quince & Company's Piper yarn. It's a lace weight yarn sold in 50 gram skeins and it's uh, made of merino fiber and mohair. So it's a merino mohair blend. I wanna say 50-50, although I could be wrong. And there's about 221 yard. No, that's a different, it's a different yarn, but um, it is, uh, it's, it's lace weight and I bought three skeins. And I'm only, 
So they're 50 gram skeins, as I just mentioned, um, and I'm only this far into my second skein, already working on the first sleeve. So if I crack into the third skein for this sweater, I will be surprised. It does kind of make me regret binding off um, along the pattern's instructions, because if I made it just a little bit longer, I might be able to wear it with more stuff, and I have the yarn to do it. So um, I want to say, too, that the, well, I'm not going to undo a single ply yarn just to make it longer. I'll just, I'll just use the yarn in some other project. Um, and if I don't know what to do with a single 50 gram skein of lace weight single ply yarn, then maybe I'll hold it double and I'll knit like a hat or something. I don't know. But this fabric is turning out very nice. I've never actually knit with a single ply yarn before. And I want to say that I felt, even from the moment I bought it, I felt good about this yarn because one thing that kind of turns me off from single ply yarn is that if it is, so um, I'm just going to backtrack for a moment. Sorry, I need to fix this. If a, so one thing about yarn construction to know is that every single, so whether you have a single ply yarn or a two ply yarn or a three ply, ply yarn, four ply, eight ply, whatever, every individual single is spun in one direction. And then when you're plying yarn, you're plying those singles together in the opposite direction. So when you're spinning yarn with the intention of plying it, you're putting a little bit more spin into that single ply. When you're spinning yarn to just be a single ply, you're not putting in as much spin to the single because you don't need to compensate for it being spun later in the opposite direction when all the singles are applied together. And one thing that I could tell just even from the skein of Quince and Company's Piper yarn is that it has the right amount of twist for a single ply. Sometimes you'll find single ply yarns that have a little bit more twist than they need and that's okay. It just means that when you knit that fabric up, it's going to have a certain quality to it that either you didn't anticipate or maybe alters the way that the pattern looks, it'll kind of slant in one direction. Um, the stitch, the V's of the stitches won't sit vertically up and down exactly right. They're going to kind of have a lean to one direction or another. And um, just because I'm, I haven't knit with every single type of yarn before, I don't really have a, a relationship with that yarn or, or kind of can anticipate how it behaves. I just have always sort of steer, steered clear of single ply yarns, knowing that they might slant. And I just knew by looking at this that it was very even, if anything, a little bit underspun. So that when you're knitting, you know how like when you knit with one end of the yarn, just the act of knitting it kind of brings a little bit more twist into it. And if you're knitting from the other direction, it does the opposite and takes a little bit of twist out. I feel like this this is really well balanced. So uh, if I give you a little close up for a moment on just what the stock in it, am I showing you exactly where I have a break in my yarn? I don't know. There's one part where I, my cat chewed my yarn and it's right in the middle of the sweater. And it kind of bummed me out. If it were on the back, I wouldn't care so much. Obviously this is not blocked, but, and it's a very loose gauge knit. Um, but I feel like You'll see when it's blocked that it is very even. Uh, everyone's knitting a ranunculus sweater. I'm probably the last to start, <laughs> but um, you know, I could see myself making another one of these just because every different type of yarn you, you use is gonna give you a different quality of sweater. Um, and it's really easy to modify being top down. You could simply make it longer if you want it longer. You can make any type of sleeve basically you want, short, half, quarter, long. I think that I might make this a sort of puff sleeve. I'm thinking of just continuing it straight and then right when it gets to the cuff, just um, knit two together all the way around, maybe a second time, just depending on how tight that gets, and then just doing a little bit of ribbing. 
and this is my ranunculus. I should finish this rather soon. I have a, um, so I'm working this weekend, um, but I have uh, next weekend off. We're gonna go to Ocean City for our annual putt-putt golf tournament with my husband's high school friends, which is always really fun. I get a lot of knitting done in the car ride there and, and not so much back because sometimes we drive all the way home a few hours, like really late at night after dinner. And sometimes we stay at his parents' house, which is another long car ride home the next day. So um, I even like try to knit between holes, um, which leads to a lot of mistakes. So I need a stock and net project for real, for real um, before, before next weekend. And I don't, I don't know if it'll be this or something else, but I've cast on a few things that I'm excited to show you. So this is nearly done, but also very easy knit now that the lace is over. Uh, the second project I have on my needles is one that I haven't quite um, worked on much since I last showed you, but it is the Aspen socks or leg warmers. I'm knitting the leg warmers and this is the front. This is the back. You can see I'm working the increases to open it up for the calf and to go above the knee. And I'm a little, so I went up at least a needle size. I, I threw this on a other set of needles just to try it on, but um, I'm a little worried that so I, I don't want it to be loose because I don't want it to fall down and I want it to fit snugly. And I, I think that, you know, it'll kind of stretch, you know, like once you wet it and block it and, um, but I noticed that like when it's on the leg, it, you know, it's not, you know, it's stretched out. I just want to make sure I'm doing it right. I don't know. I guess there's no right way to do it, but I mean, if it fits, it fits. I just don't know like how tight should it fit before it's like kind of stretched out, you know? Uh, so this, this is a chart that I think by the time it's over, I'll have repeated this motif six times. Um, and even after the second time, it's way more, uh, it's way less kind of mentally, you know, challenging because you do start to memorize it a little bit. Um, and the same goes for the diamond motif on the back. Um, so I don't know if this would be a great putt-putt golf project because it's small and I can like fit it under my arm or tuck it in my pocket or if it would be a bad one because it's not simple stockinette. Uh, I'm sure there's some sweater that I have in my queue that has, you know, sleeves that you knit from the bottom up that I should just begin doing before I, before we go. But, uh, I'm, I'm not forgetting about these. These will be knit. <laughs> I feel like if I don't come back to them regularly, like I could see myself just not, not finishing it because people don't glorify leg warmers like they do sweaters and so it's all about the sweater these days and I want to I want to make sure that my wardrobe has everything I need to maximize the the wearability of things I have that I often don't turn to um, I have quite an array of vintage and mostly hand sewn if not like union US made wool skirts in my wardrobe and I never turn to wear them because I don't I'm not, I'm not the most fancy type of lady. I don't, I, I did buy a pair of stockings because I felt like I needed to own them in case of an unexpected formal event, but I don't put stockings on my body ever. And so in the winter, like that's pretty mandatory. Um, and so I wanted a pair of leg warmers that are kind of like stockings. I would say these are more like wool stockings than they are leg warmers. Um, I wanted a pair of wool stockings to wear with my skirts so that I got better use of them. And that's what these are. And last night, they're actually on the same needles because I just used this like 40 inch 
size three to put on to to stretch these out more but on the same set of needles I have uh, the third row of my newest cast on and if you haven't guessed yet this is Andrea Mallory's daydreamer pattern um, I'm knitting it can you even see the details of this fabric not yet but um it is a woolen spun two ply fingering weight yarn made by Elsa Wool. I believe that their yarn is grown and milled in Canada um, and it's Cormo fiber um, and it is blended so it's all natural and no dyes and it's white with a little bit of gray. I want to say the 30% gray um, because they don't they don't name their yarns they just have like 30% 70% whatever. Um, and they sell both woolen and worsted spun yarn. And I bought, I actually asked for this for Christmas a couple years ago. So I've just been kind of squishing this periodically, knowing that I need the very best project to, like like something that I will want to wear forever and throw on any given day. And um, although I feel like I could totally knit this on its own and, and love it to death, I'm holding it together with e-cigars mohair silk blend in the color six, which is kind of this, it almost looks a little darker on camera, but it's this kind of peachy, dusty, um, like a peachy rose, like a dusty peachy rose. And I think with the gray, it kind of gives this sort of cream quality. And I, I really like them together. I honestly didn't swatch for this. I'm just knitting it on the recommended needles, uh, which maybe I'll regret. I don't know. It's a big cable thing. Like I should have swatched, but I'm knitting the size small. And if my gauge is a little tight, then it'll just make up for the amount of ease that is built into the sweater. So, um, these are my things. I'm obviously moving towards a lot more neutral colors these days, although my ranunculus sweater is like the same color as this one, nearly. This is my favorite color in the world. And um, I also, so let's talk about this. It's no longer a work in progress, but I um, wanted to cast on a cardigan because I literally own zero cardigans. And I realized when I was prepping for my business professional type job, wardrobe, I, I felt like I desperately needed one. And so I, I felt like I wanted to buy a pattern and cast one on right away, which I did. And I picked up Andrea Mowry's LYS sweater pattern. And I decided I would start knitting it in this yarn. It is Quince and Company's Finch yarn. It's a three ply fingering weight wor woolen, uh, sorry, worsted spun yarn. And I would categorize this as like a heavy fingering. It's not this, it's not the same weight of yarn that you would get of like a super wash um, fingering that you're, you, I don't know, like, you know how super wash fingering skeins tend to feel. They're a little bit lighter and some are lighter than others. Um, this game is not out. But I would categorize this as like a heavier fingering rather than a light fingering, which I wonder if that is what um, the sweater was originally knit in. I don't have access to the yarn that the pattern was knit in. And I think I could only buy it online if I wanted to. And I tend to not buy yarn online any longer. Um, I prefer to pick it up at festivals or, you know, if there's like a specific source of fiber that I'm interested in, that that's when I'll buy it online, like the fiber content rather than, uh, you know, whatever. But um, I picked up this yarn in July at the Knitwit uh, yarn shop in Portland, Maine. And I honestly, oh, it's the same yarn that I'm knitting my leg warmer slash stockings in. And um, I just knew that I liked this yarn. It's like your basic workhorse great quality, domestically grown and milled and dyed USA product. So um, I started knitting the sleeve 
and the sleeve fits perfectly um, at the three quarter length kind of thing. And I think that when I when I put the sweater on here, I like this sleeve a lot. Um, at the same time, I just it doesn't resonate with me personally. Um, and I don't know if that's just because I'm not willing to step out of my comfort zone in terms of style, or if it's just not my style. Uh, I think that when it's done, it'll look really nice. Um, but I fear that, you know, because in the state of Maryland, I feel you're either wearing a tank top or t-shirt and sweating constantly, or you're putting a coat on over a sweater. Like there's no like real long stretch of time where you're just pulling, I don't know, I'm making up a story here, right? Cause anybody, if you work in a very air conditioned space, which I did for just two weeks, this would be a great garment to make. I no longer work in the chiropractic office. I took up a job in um, just two weeks ago because man, I'll tell you that story in a minute. But um, I feel like I don't really need this garment anymore and it might be too formal. It might not be like the thing I wanna throw on just because of the sleeve length, um, which I could just start over and maybe cast on fewer stitches and add a few more increases and make it a full length. Um, but I'm not sure I want to do that either. So I just decided to take out the needles, try it on and cast on other things. Um, and I may or may not continue this project and I may or may not knit the sweater in a different yarn. That's a little bit lighter weight. Um, Yeah. I feel like the more I talk about it, the more I like it and the more I want to want to make it. I feel like this dusty rose, it's not dusty rose, but it is kind of like a pinkish brown gray. It's almost an undefined color. Um, it's, it's also outside of my comfort zone too. So I think that's just why I hesitate because I don't quite know how to make it work for me. Um, but I think I maybe need to just have a little faith and continue on. Uh, yeah. Um, so that's that. That's everything I have to show you. I want, I, I literally just cast on the Daydreamer, but I feel like I need to cast on another sweater too, um, because I want a stockinette thing again, as I mentioned. Oh, I told you about my job thing. So I, if you have, if you're new to watching this podcast and you don't know whatever I might've mentioned in previous episodes, I was formerly a district manager of uh, the Baltimore region of yoga studios. And I loved my job. Um, there were times where it became really challenging too. Like, you know, I might have two studios without a manager and then I have troubles with other managers and I need to coach them and work on them. And I just can't be in enough places, enough hours of the week. And I was just starting to burn out. Um, in addition to that, I've had some health problems over this past year where I was diagnosed with two autoimmune conditions. So one being ankylosing spondylitis and the other being psoriatic arthritis. And in that 12 month span, I was literally diagnosed like within the same month of my promotion to district manager from studio manager. And I was just like really unsure that if they knew that they would, I, you know, like all that stuff. And so, um, I tried as hard as I could to sort of keep it to myself that I'm going through this health concern um, that is like a systemic and debilitating disease, to be quite honest. Like there are a couple days I couldn't even walk um, because of the dysfunction of my low spine. And uh, so I started treatment for those things and it it seemed to start off pretty well on the first medication. We added a second medication to address the inflammation that hadn't really gone away completely. And that's when things kind of got rough. Um, it was a biologic medication, meaning that, you know, it really suppresses my immune system response, which is kind of the trigger for my symptoms is that my immune system isn't operating functionally 
Um, and so that's when I would get sick right after my monthly injection. And then as soon as I found antibiotics for whatever was my concern that month, um, and I felt better, it was time for my next month injection. And then I'd immediately get sick. And that happened three months in a row. And my doctor said, we're not gonna continue this biologic. It's just not working. You know, you're, you're better off having the inflammation than being sick in, in, on antibiotics month after month after month. So, so that was hard in itself. Like I could, you know, I could show up to work with a urinary tract infection or like whatever it might be. That wasn't the worst part of it, but then she wanted me to try this other medication, which I originally refused. I did not want to take methyltrexate, but the insurance company, which didn't cover the biologic drug I took instead because it wanted it wanted me to prove that methyltrexate, the most affordable medication um, and the one with many, many uh, negative side effects, um, it, it needed me to prove that it would be ineffective before covering alternatives. So I went on this drug for three months because that's the number of days that is required. It's like 12 weeks required to show and prove it's ineffective. I had to take it for that long. And in those 12 weeks, my mental health like rapidly decreased. Like I went through this complete downward spiral of just anxiety, depression, um, and that's all because the other symptoms of the medication were like nausea, la loss of appetite, my hair falling out. Like it was just miserable not knowing I need to eat food, not like having to force myself to eat food, having to feel nauseous when I did eat food or when I didn't eat food, and then the things that happen when you're not eating well, like the anger, the fatigue, like everything compounded itself. And like, also when you're taking a drug like methyltrexate at night, you have to take in the morning folic acid because it completely wipes out like all folic acid in your body. It's one of the reasons why if you're taking methyltrexate, you really can't get pregnant while you're on it or even a while after you're, you've been on it. Um, which also stressed me out emotionally, not because I ever really want to have kids, but because I'm 34 years old and like, you know, this is determining my future, whether I know what my future is or not. Um, so that stressed me out. And uh, one thing about folic acid is it's like a B vitamin. And if you're supplementing with folic acid, it can mask the symptoms of something like a B12 deficiency. And it was clear to me that I was insanely depleted in B12 vitamins because of my mental health kind of rapidly declining as it did. So I've since stopped taking that medication. That was like months ago. At the same time, when I made that decision, I was like really deep in all of this shit. <laughs> and I was just like, I can't do my job. Like I want to, but like, I I can't handle the stress of seven businesses needing my support. And that's when I was just like, I'm going to find another job. I'm going to step out of this level of responsibility. I don't know what to do with my life. Like, I don't do I now need to collect disability? Like what? Like that's where I was at in that state. So I stopped taking the medication. It took me several weeks to find another job. At that point, I was like not really sure why I was leaving, except that I made the decision for myself and for my health that I'm taking less responsibility. And then I start my new job. I spend a week in between jobs like cultivating a wardrobe and buying from the thrift store and I was shopping on ThreadUp, which I do not recommend anyone buy any wool product on ThreadUp because it's shrunken and that's why it's for sale. But I started my job and it was really weird. It was really weird. So the first red flag was I was told what my schedule would be, which I was willing to accept. And I felt like I was compromising myself a little bit because it was 9.30 a.m. to 7 p.m. Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Okay, that's a long day. But Tuesdays, Thursdays, it's like 11.30 to 7. Great. Those are like half days. I'll take that. I was told every day you get a one hour lunch break, 
perfect. That brings it down to like 40 hours a week. I love that. I want that. Let's do that. And then I start and it's like, no, not, you don't really get an hour, full hour every day. Most days you get a half hour. It's like, I can't go to the store and get lunch and eat lunch and come back in 30 minutes if I'm not prepared. And I need to be prepared with, I haven't gotten to that yet, but anyway, I was just like, okay, so what I was told before accepting the job is not what I'm told after I accept the job. That's annoying. Um, and then I never got to meet the owner, like operator of the business because they were in training in Florida and it was taking longer than anticipated. And I thought, what kind of training takes longer than anticipated? Like it's scheduled, you know, like it's planned. And then I come to find out like literally on my last day. So I've already made up my mind that I'm leaving, but I find out that he's like basically in Clearwater, Florida on the Scientology cruise ship going through some type of training where you have to take it enough times that you finally answer everything correctly. And I just thought, I don't know that I want to work for a Scientologist's medical office at all. And that just sealed the deal for me. I don't know if there's any Scientologists out there. Um, but if you are, you're in a cult, call your dad. And on Friday after my first week, I found out that one of my like top studio managers got a job offer for mom's organic grocery. And she was going to accept a salary that was greater than mine, literally as like the district manager. So I was like, so happy for her. And I was like, please give me that job <laughs> at that studio. I will manage the crap out of that studio for ever and ever. It's 10 minutes from my house. I got the salary. I was working at this chiropractic office, which was great. And I'm back at the company I was working for in a lesser role, but with responsibilities that I feel like will work for me no matter how I'm feeling, because it's just a lot less responsibility day to day and a lot fewer people calling me on the phone and a lot fewer people yelling at me about this or that and a lot fewer a lot less drama i would say so i'm super pumped i'm really excited i hope that i hope that um everyone else is too because it's super weird to leave a company as a top sort of role in a region and then come back and you know you don't want to step on any toes but i have an incredible boss She's really good at performing as a district manager, so I feel great about that. And that's what's going on with me here. And I also have a health coach now. Um, so since stopping methyltrexate, I knew I needed to approach managing my illness in a way that might be more, like obviously less damaging, but potentially more beneficial. And I've been reading on the research of these types of autoimmune conditions and what the gut, um, like how the health of your gut contributes to autoimmune disease. And um, one thing that I find really fascinating, and I like to tell, I like to share things like this in case it's helpful to you. And by no means do I want to put any pressure on you to adapt some alternative lifestyle you're not comfortable with. But one thing that I think is really cool is that it is said, and this could be incorrect, but the your intestinal lining is just about like one cell deep in terms of your your body's makeup. Like it's very, it's a very, I mean, it's just one cell layer between what's inside your intestine and what's outside. And what reinforces that layer of cells is the byproduct of the good gut in your bacteria. So the good gut in your bacteria, they basically feed off of fiber. Um, and it, it might be one particular strain, but it could be more than one strain. And as they feed off that fiber, they develop a byproduct that lines the gut. So your intestinal wall is so much less you than it is the byproduct of what makes up your microbiome. And so you want to make sure that you're eating the right foods to keep that microbiome healthy and 
made up of good bacteria that are going to build that intestinal wall for you because it's not something you can do on your own. It, it doesn't exist that way. And so if you have a gut that has permeability because maybe your diet isn't ideal or your microbiome is not ideal, which apparently is really, really hard to change. Like if you were born and maybe you were never breastfed or were never provided nutritious and healthy food. Like I grew up eating popcorn and tater tots and cereal and ice cream. Like those are the things I remember eating every single day, like without exaggeration. So I know that my microbiome isn't gonna change overnight. It's not gonna change in a week, two weeks, a month, a year, maybe even forever. And that's why it's important that I maintain a really consistent regimen in my dietary intake um, to curb the inflammation in my body and make sure to rebuild my microbiome of my gut and the health of my gut so that the rest of the systems function ideally. I won't get into the rest of the research about the autoimmune disease and how there's like mimicry among the molecules of cartilage versus gut leaking, but that is fascinating to me. And since having a life coach, I've been doing um, like a full blown elimination diet where I've discovered I'm a lot of my symptoms are triggered by uh, gluten and dairy, which is challenging to say the least. Um, you would never think that like pain in your hands would come from eating gluten. But in my case, that's what it is. And because bread is so delicious, like, of course, I'm never going to discover that on my own without someone helping me to forcibly eliminate those things. So I'm adapting to that gluten-free, dairy-free lifestyle. And it because I feel so good, like in my hands and my feet especially, I don't feel like I want to eat gluten or dairy until I'm... I'm feeling good so consistently that I forget that if I eat them, I will actually feel bad. And that's sort of where I struggle to maintain my new sort of regimen. But I'm super happy that I'm not constantly in pain anymore, which is, I mean, all I could ask for, really. Um, so that's what's going on. And uh, I like my job. <laughs> it's not the job I had a week ago, so... <laughs> Um, I'm just trying to not get too thin, especially with like being so restricted in my diet. I'm a little self-conscious of that because so many people feel like they need to be or obviously our culture values thinness. Um, and unfortunately, like I can only learn because it's not my lived experience, but like fat people are shamed and treated so fucking bad that it sucks that it, it almost makes me hate that I'm thin, you know, like I feel like thin guilt or something, but, um, you know, that's just my own stuff I need to work through psychologically, I think, um, because, you know, I just fear that if someone has their own issues with themselves, that they're gonna, that I, like, I don't know, what I'm trying to say is that everyone has their own issues, some issues are around how they look and how they're perceived, and they're totally legitimate feelings. But because I know that exists in them, my problems, my separate problems, are that I fear they don't like me because of who I am. And that's just made up and not even real. It's totally in my head. So I'm just trying to like notice that those thoughts are there and remember that they're not real. And like I can let that go because even if it was real, that's still them and it's not me. And as long as I'm healthy and I'm happy, it shouldn't matter that I'm thin or like really thin. Um, you know, I just want everybody to be happy who they are. And I want everyone to fucking love people for who they are and not like hate them for one thing or another. Because there's nobody has, has time for that. It's not, it's not worth living your life for, basically, in my mind. So, ah. <sighs> I feel like this was a good ramble today. I'm really glad I re-recorded because I recorded this episode yesterday, went to edit it like an hour ago, and it didn't exist anymore because I accidentally deleted it. So. 
Um, I just want to thank you so much for watching this episode of the Thread to Men podcast. You can find me on Ravelry and Instagram as Taylor E. Owen. And if you haven't already subscribed to my channel, please, I need like 40 more subscribers to maybe monetize this and get some pennies in my bank account because everyone needs, you know, to buy more yarn and patterns and stuff and like that would be cool, I think. So please subscribe and like this video if you liked the video and then hopefully other people will find it and like it and subscribe to my channel. So thanks again for watching. I hope you have a wonderful day and I'll see you soon.